NordVPN is becoming more than just a VPN. Threat protection will guard your device against malicious websites, malware, trackers, and intrusive ads, even if you're not connected to a VPN server at the time. Step up your cybersecurity and stay safe. Has failed, I tell you, the world has failed yet again. <laughs> I'm going to say, Michael, thank you so much for doing this with me. And you know what oh, you're yeah. saying, right, that you're you you know, you're not a banker or something. Like, I'm a bloody social worker. <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, okay, but I've okay. learned this stuff. I've mm. learned this stuff through learning about gold and silver and then coming across Bitcoin and actually looking at, well, what is money and what is real currency? So yeah. anyway, we'll, we'll just start like this, right? So thank, okay. you, thank you so much. Do you want to do a quick introduction about who you are and why you are and why we're talking? Yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Michael Leahy. I've been on your show before, Rich, and uh, you know I, I'm running for the European Parliament for Ireland South. Uh, we're a, a new party, the Irish Freedom Party. We have serious concerns about the European Union. We have serious concerns about its architecture in terms of politics. I'm also becoming extremely concerned about the stability of its, of its currency, about the euro, whether it's a, a con job, whether there's anything backing it up, um, particularly when we see... The impact that Ukrainian wars having wars change things very dramatically, and they can change values of currencies very dramatically. Uh, I don't think that European states people understand this yet. I think they're playing with fire when they seek to escalate the war, um, and I think that they really should be aiming for peace. Uh, wars change things very dramatically. The most dramatic change is the sanctions against our cheap energy, which Germany has enjoyed for the past 20, 30 years from Russia. If that comes to an end, does the German economic model still continue to work? Uh, and if it doesn't, what's the basis of the euro currency? We were told that the euro currency would be stable because of the German industrial model. Is that still going to be the case? Um, but I guess if we could start off this whole thing with, you know, that most most people don't understand banking. And it doesn't seem to be that complicated, but they make it they make it very complicated, maybe because of the language that they use. And there was a time not that long ago when currencies, including the US dollar, was based on the gold standard. And Britain came off the gold standard a long time before that, back in the 20s. But uh, President Nixon was a very brilliant uh, president, without a doubt, one of the most capable that they've had. But he made the decision, perhaps that decision was forced on him uh, by outside forces, perhaps it was forced on by his own banking sector. He made the decision to take the United States dollar off the gold standard. It had been worth $35 to the ounce of gold. It seems remarkable now, given, given the levels that we're at. Was that... A mistake? Did he have a choice? Was it the biggest? Way? Is that actually what he's going to be remembered for? More so than Watergate. I mean, everybody thinks of Watergate when they think of Nixon. In future years, do you think they will remember Nixon as the man who made the terrible mistake of taking the United States dollar off the gold standard and introducing a system where international currencies and U.S. dollars still regarded as the most stable uh, international currencies aren't actually worth anything? And what's the ramification of that for the euro? Is the euro worth anything? The euro is worth. Nothing. And, and and I said this before uh, we started recording, because you said something. I'll come to the Nixon's uh, gold standard stuff. But you said that uh, Nixon, you know, was that a big mistake in him taking gold off the the dollar off the gold off gold? Right. So it's no longer backed by gold. But before we started recording, you said you're about the euro being built on a foundation on Germans, e Germans economy and its strong manufacturing base and everything. Right. Uh, and that's what it's supposed to be about now. And I said to you, and I'm going to say it again so people can hear, the euro is a tool of colonial extraction. That's what it's for. And the Northern... Can you explain? Can you explain? Uh, well, the Northern, I'll give a couple of examples, right? So the, uh, one is a metaphor and the other is actually an example. So the Northern European nations have done really, really well out of the euro. The Southern and the Eastern European nations have suffered because they don't have the same level of productivity. Their economies aren't as strong. And it's allowed the Northern European nations and the Northern European banks to extract wealth from the South. Now, this is, do, do you understand fractals, Michael? 
fractal world, okay, tell me what they are. Oh, okay. see you, even if you yeah, didn't... I, know, I, know, I know the term, I know the whole yeah. concept of fractional reserve banking, and you know, maybe that's what you're getting at. No, I mean, no, no, uh, no. We, 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 saw, we saw the extraction of wealth from Ireland during yeah. the property bubble and how the euro was used to extract enormous wealth from Ireland. So absolutely robbed us blind and then left us with this colossal debt that we'd never be able to pay. That's 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 what the euro means to me. And yeah. I, I, and, I, and I, I still, opposed to the the euro being, right from the beginning. Yeah, it's still, it's still being used that way. So, mm. um, so a fractal, even if you did know there are people watching who won't know, is a, is a self-repeating pattern at different scales. So, for example, the Norwegian coast, when you look at it from outer space, it's crinkly. When you yeah, look yeah. from the atmosphere, it's crinkly. You're standing on the coastline, you look down, it's, at all scales, it's crinkly. It's mm -hmm. the same pattern, right? Human behavior shows up in patterns. So you're standing for, you're the deputy leader of the Irish Freedom Party, and this is what I believe your policies are. You want um, Ireland out of the, so you personally, right, you want Ireland out of the European Union, you're a sovereigntist, you want autonomy, you want an end to this open borders, mm. right? Now, those va that, that are destroying Irish culture and tradition in society, now those values that you hold personally, were you to become the Irish Prime Minister, or the Deputy Prime Minister, those values will be played out on a much larger scale. It's mm -hmm. the same values, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you were somehow find yourself as president of the European Union, <laughs> I don't know how that would happen, right? But those values would be played out on a much larger scale, the same ideas. Yeah. Yep. Now, it, yeah. now we can go the, the reverse way with regards to the euro. So what you have with the euro is you have nations like Italy and Spain and Greece all of them really, apart from possibly Germany and France, that have no say over European monetary policy. They have no say over the euro. Mm -hmm. Right now, if we reduce it to re reduce it to this metaphor, mm -hmm. you've got your household budget. You work, you earn an income, you decide where you're going to spend it, right? We're going to have a situation where I, all the way over in the UK, am in charge of your finances, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have a say on how it gets spent. And then I will tell you how you're going to spend it. You're going to spend it on, you're going to, I don't know what heating system you have in your home. You're going to get rid of that and you're going to have wind turbines made out of paper mache because that's the policy that I'm imposing upon you. And if you don't do that, well, I'm going to fine you because I'm the one that's holding your funds. You have no sovereignty. Oh, and by the way, I've got some family over in Pakistan. They're coming to stay in your house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we can see that playing out. Now, you know, in terms of us leaving the European Union, for Ireland, it's going to be extremely difficult. And I, I would actually oppose a precipitous withdrawal from the European Union because they would come after us and try to destroy us. We've got to negotiate our way out of this. Sure. And my input into the, into the European Parliament, I think there's a lot of countries beginning to feel the same. This system is just not working. It's not working for a whole range of countries. You look at your, uh, Hungary, you look at Eastern Europe, Holland, even the farmers there, they're getting very concerned. You know, there's a big Eurosceptic party in Germany, a big Eurosceptic party in France. We've got to negotiate our position with those guys. And we've got to stop raising it in terms of a small country like Ireland leaving. As far as I'm concerned, the European Union needs to be abolished. And we need to, you know, those countries need to come together again and have a trading relationship. And Britain might be well be interested in rejoining that trading relationship. It's the union, it's the political establishment of the union and the currency establishment of the euro, which Britain very astutely did not form part of. That's the problem. Yes. And that's, that, that's where our sovereignty is lost. And as Jack Delors said, you can have all the politics you want, but we control your currency, we control your country. And that's, that's what's right. happening. You know? which, which was, I hope, my example earlier made clear. Yeah. You'd mm -hmm. have no say on what you're going to spend your money on. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have no sovereignty. You are yeah. a serf to this autocrat in a faraway mm. land whom mm. you can't vote out or remove. And then you're going to That's try to negotiate with me? Well, no, wait a minute. There's a lot of benefit in it for me. There's a lot of benefit for Brussels and the Eurocrats and the European bankers and all that make money that, that benefit from this system, the system of colonial control. Because colonial, colonialism, one way of looking at it, it's a system where people don't have a say over their own lives. They're ruled from afar. Mm by people mm -hmm. who they're not accountable to. And then here's another example. Do you know about the colonial franc? Yes, of course. So the, the, the North African franc, which is yeah. France is still used, using in various countries. North. It's remarkable that those countries haven't branched out and well, broken so away they, from it. They're, they're beginning to do so because they're now in a position, mm -hmm. by, you know, by getting friendly with Russia and China, that they're able to mm -hmm. 
their own independence and sovereignty. And Russia and China don't have the imperial legacy that the European Union nations have, right? So for people who don't know, countries like, um, until very recently, the Francophile countries in North and West Africa, um, I can't think, Burkina Faso until very recently. Me, me, me here is a classic one. I think yeah, Mali, Bad, yeah. like that, Cameroon perhaps, right? They don't have their own currency. They have the mm. colonial franc, franc, the CFA, which is pegged to the euro. Mm. They're not in charge of how they run their lives. And what it allowed mm -hmm. uh, France to do with Niger is they could buy uranium for pennies on the dollar, I think for less mm. than $2 a kilo, when the market yeah. rate was $150 a kilo. France is buying uranium from Niger, one of the poorest countries in the world, and then using that to power its power, nuclear power stations, and then it's selling that power to its own people at a profit, at a markup, and an even greater markup to other Western nations. And it's all on the backs of stealing the wealth from the Nigerians. And the two cities where they extract uranium, they're French mining companies, they don't even have electricity. That's awful stuff, yeah. Awful but, but, stuff. That, but, that show, but that highlights the brutality of the euro. But the, the thing with the euro is it's all covered up with this pretense. Mm -hmm. It's for your own good and European unity. All the while, the colonial rulers are destroying the nations underneath them and extracting wealth mm -hmm. by indebting them, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how the euro is a, is a tool of colonial extraction. Mm -hmm. Then the other okay. thing about um, you said about Nixon taking the dollar of the gold standard. Do you know why he did that? Uh, I think he, I think because the gold sent over a warship to take his gold out of Fort Knox. Was that, that was one that, that was the why? problem. With me. But do why? you know why they want to do that? So what, what the US was doing was printing loads and loads of dollars in order to pay for the killing of people in Vietnam. War is not yeah. cheap, right? Yeah. And and by the doing gold, that, the, the gold saw that, 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 that it wasn't based on anything else, I guess that was it, wasn't it? You know? <laughs> They, they were using they were using French gold to, to do so. I guess was that was well, that the problem? No, because there wasn't the gold to. They were increasing all the dollars, and there wasn't mm -hmm. the gold to back the dollars. So they were debasing the value of the dollars that were held in foreign reserves. And the mm -hmm. gold said, "You don't have the gold to back these dollars up." So mm -hmm. then, what happened is the, the the Kissinger went to Saudi Arabia, did a deal with Saudi Arabia, said, mm -hmm. "We're going to sell oil for dollars only, mm -hmm. and we, we will protect you." Yeah. Yep, you know right. where that, that deal or right, everything, yeah. right? But you will only take um, dollars for oil. Yeah, and then they uh, Nixon separated. He broke the link between the dollar and and, the, and gold, and so the dollar became free floating. Mm -hmm. And because a country like Bangladesh needed to buy dollars, needed dollars to buy oil of Saudi Arabia or the other OPEC mm -hmm. nations, Bangladesh would then go and buy dollars. And that allowed the U.S. to keep printing the dollars without having hyperinflation at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now. Yeah. I mean, I I I knew about the the Kissinger deal with Saudi, but I didn't know that. I I actually thought that the coming out the gold standard had preceded that, and that in nineteen seventy two that deal was all at the same time. It was all set up around about the same time. Because yeah, but nineteen seventy two was coming out the gold standard. I thought that nineteen seventy four was the 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 petro dollar was just called. I mean, it may have been effectively in place before then. But do you think that's going to last? I mean, we, we see the emergence of the BRICS nations now. We see Saudi dabbling with the BRICS nations. You know, if, if I mean, if if Saudi suddenly announces, right, where the petrodollar is gone, what are, you, what are the ramifications of that for Western economies? Well, I, I, <laughs> I dare to think. But there have been over 3,500 fiat currencies, so government-issued mm -hmm. currencies, not gold, not silver, and now mm -hmm. not Bitcoin, because they're not issued by governments. Right, but a fear like when a government declares this is it, right? This is this is currency. This is money. This can be used for exchange. There's been over three and a half thousand of them. Every single one has gone to zero, mm. and eventually the dollar will go to zero. The, I think the euro will crash first, um, depending upon how the election goes uh, later on this year and what happens in the UK, because the pound could crash first. Because the euro, the eurocrats need the pound in order to shore up the euro and make the euro look stronger. And they would also benefit from access to Britain's hydrocarbons. Mm. Because essentially, no, real money, real not currency, real mm. money is tokenized mm. energy. That's what it is. Yeah. 
Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Currency is a derivative of that. So, so when the dollar was backed by gold, it was gold is money. Gold is absolute real money. If you don't believe me, you take an ounce of gold. I promise you, people in Africa, South America, India, Japan, China, they'd be very happy with that, right? Gold is real money. Everything, all other assets are measured ultimately against gold. Whether even if they're not tied to it, Bitcoin, the dollar, the euro, it all goes down to gold. Everything. Mm -hmm. Gold is the bottom of that whole foundation. Yeah. And then the dollar, even now, even though it's not tied, and even when it was tied, is a derivative of gold. It's a representative. It's not the real thing. Mm -hmm. Now, all fiat currency systems collapse, and they collapse the way that they're collapsing now in the West, where you have conflict, incredible corruption, a drive to war. I mean, Michael, you know, apart from Orban, and perhaps Maloney, perhaps, I'm not so sure, right? But apart from Orban or Jeremy Corbyn and a few other, you know, minor figures, there's no one in Europe arguing for peace. It's extraordinary. No, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. Uh, when you see a totally incompetent former defence minister, Ursula von der Leyen, beating the drums of war, and we have so many of our MEPs and my opponents in the election, Billy Keller in particular in Ireland South, seem to be want to ramp up the whole situation of a war in, in Eastern Europe. And do they not realize that, that this, is, this is going to escalate into a, a third world war? Um, it's, it, but it seems to be about, I don't know, is, is it about protecting the currency? Is it about creating a crash? Is it about making an excuse for, for the currency crash that the sea is going to come? Or is it just an inevitable aspect of the collapse of a currency? Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, yeah. I, I, one of the things that people need to be informed of, how imminent is this? Uh, when I was on with Tom Luongi there with you a couple of weeks back, I, I posed that same question to him. Those of you have an idea of how even this is. Um, and and, and it's, 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 a, it's a tough question to ask. You know, yeah. like asking people to predict the future, that's not easy. You know? But um, people need to know, I guess, you know, that people need to have a, have a handle on that. Um, I, I've always said wars dramatically change events. They precipitate circumstances. Uh, wars can spin out of control very, very quickly. They can go in a completely different direction. I, I just think that Russia has some, I, I, you know, there may be a major offensive there. You just don't know what's going on. And, and we certainly are not getting the truth in the European Union. Like, uh, the reportage we're getting from the war is, is very, very sketchy. And uh, pe people are being kept informed. They think this is a minor peripheral border dispute somewhere. But its potential to escalate into, into a third world war is it's very, very close, unfortunately. And um, is that going to be the thing that brings about the currency collapse, or is the currency collapse going to be the thing that, that escalates the war? That's, that's, well, the, that's the, cur the currency is already collapsing. Mm -hmm. It's already collapsing. Let me show you something. Uh, hold on a second. Wait, can you see my screen there okay? I can, yeah. I can indeed, yeah. Okay. So uh, this is – let me just expand that. Yeah, I can't read the details. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's better, yeah. This is the, the – how much – Bitcoin, one pound will buy you. Mm. And it goes, this chart goes back to May 2016. So yeah, in okay. 2016, one pound would have bought you 0 0.0032 Bitcoin. Mm. And here, what, four zeros, mm -hmm. 0 0.4092. And here, mm. four zeros, one nine. Now, the thing about why have I used Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin doesn't. It's a deflationary asset, mm. which means it's th there is new supply coming on, but the amount coming on is going down, going down, going down, and it's limited in supply, unlike the pound. And all that's been happened, you have more and more pounds chasing fewer bitcoins. So yeah. this is value. And this is the same for the euro. This is the mm -hmm. same for the dollar. This is the same for all fiat currencies relative mm -hmm. to something well, of fixed supply, like gold, like bitcoin, like, to a lesser extent, like silver. Just a lot more abundant, which is also I consider also to be money. Mm -hmm. well, well, it's already collapsing. It just hasn't gone to zero yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. You got the euro as the yellow line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And then I can add the dollar. Very similar graphs all the way through, aren't I? All the way through. All mm -hmm. the way through. You said something earlier. Let me stop sharing. Is this inevitable? My assertion is this is inevitable. Uh, when there's fiat currencies, because they, there is no integrity in the system. Now, if Michael, if, if I may go in a slight dissertation with you, 
here, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, yeah. yeah. And I think people don't understand this. We've got elections happening in, in Britain, and what's likely are people going to vote for Labour, and Labour going to print more pounds, and it's, we're going to have the same thing. And, and you know, you've got elections in Ireland, they're going to continue inflating it away. So um, I understand you're an architect. That's right. So you'll understand the importance of foundation. By the way, how this conversation is going to go is I'm going to present this idea and then this idea and this idea and this idea, and then they'll kind of come together, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not an architect. For people who don't know the importance of foundation, if if I'm building a house, I need a foundation that's strong enough and secure enough to support the house. Now, if the foundation is weak, then what happens to the house? At some it crumbles. Point? It crumbles. Yeah, it slowly falls apart, it gets cracks, and you have subsidence, and maybe the roof will cave in, right? Or, and, and then if there's some sort of uh, event like a strong wind, then it could collapse. Now, if I'm building a tower, then I have, need to have a really, really strong foundation. A house foundation won't do it. Okay, so the foundation has to have integrity. And by integrity, I mean it's got to be sound, it's got to be unimpaired. It's got to have all the things that it needs in order to work properly. If you have a foundation of integrity, then you can have a house or a tower of integrity, one that will stand and prevail. Okay. So I'm going to move on to another example. Right? Which, can I just ask you, do you think when Nixon's history comes to be written in uh, maybe 50 years that that would be seen? What, did he have a choice? Or was it just the, the only the internal economy of the United States that couldn't sustain being on a gold standard the way they were operating the, the, the economy at that time? Um, did he have any choice in that? Yeah. It, it, well, if, if what he wanted to do was to pursue the mass murder of Vietnamese people, then he had no choice other than to. Okay. Right. One of the things that uh, Bitcoin, gold and silver make really, it's impossible. Governments can't print more Bitcoin, gold and silver to mm. then mine metals to manufacture missiles to send across the world to drop on people in foreign lands. Yep. Can't okay. do that with those. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Some sort of derivative system that allows for that. And that's what currencies are. They're derivatives. They're not the real thing. So, so let me move on to something else, right, about why this sort of collapse is inevitable when we have a um, – when there's no integrity. So um, take – so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start and then get small and then scale it up, okay? So you take a marriage. And it's an honorable marriage where the husband and wife conduct their relations and their communications with integrity. So they don't lie to each other. They honor their agreements. When they break their agreements, they clean them up and restore it. Now, that's the kind of marriage that will sustain and prevail. Yes? Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 You know, they're faithful. They, they work things out. They're working together. You know, it's not impaired anyway. It's sound. Now, th then now you extend that out to the family. If the whole family, like the larger extended family, are all the same way, yep. that they clean stuff up, they honor their agreements, they they trust each other, they're trustworthy, they resolve stuff, right? Then that family is going to be really, really strong and it's going to prevail. Sure, and then yeah. you move it larger to a network or a society where people are all engaging with each other with integrity. And I don't mean morality. I'm talking mm -hmm. about ways that are sound, unimpaired, everything's there for the relationships to work, things are taken care of with each other, then that society will prevail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the currency of exchange in that society is language. Language as an abstraction. Like I'll say to you, Michael, you know, you and I are cousins, right? In this extended workable family. I'll mm -hmm. say to you, Michael, I will meet you at such and such a time. Mm -hmm. So that's not the actual thing itself. That's the representation, the agreement, the concept, the abstraction. And then I'll meet mm -hmm. you at that time, or if I'm going to be late, I'll let you know ideally beforehand. So it's all taken care of, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you take a situation that, like the contrast where you have a husband and wife and there's no integrity, they don't honor their agreements, they lie to each other, they misrepresent, there are, it's, it's full of fakery and fraud and falsehoods. How long is that marriage going to last? Mm -hmm. It's not going to last long at all, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but also, they're going to start compensating and covering up for their inauthenticities. They're going to pretend to be doing the right thing while mm -hmm. they're lying and cheating. Yeah. And then if you extend that out to the extended family, the society, 
what you're going to have is conflict and fraud and falsehoods and fakery and people covering up and lying and cheating and pretending that they're not. You're just going to have an environment for corruption. OK, now we're going to come to currency and money. So what money is, is tokenized energy. It's work, it's labor, it's effort. Yep. So, for example, I'm a cobbler. I put in effort and energy in learning the trade, in becoming a really great cobbler, and then making this really great pair of shoes. And then you give me a gold ounce for them. And the gold ounce itself took work to create. First, it had to be mined and dug out of the ground and then moved. And then you, as an architect, you had to earn that gold ounce. You had to put effort in. And that also included the effort that it took for you to qualify as an architect. So then you exchange, you give me this gold ounce for these fabulously expensive, wonderful, you've never worn shoes this comfortable before. Yep. Okay. That's, that's honest money. That's an honest exchange. It's not the case with fiat currency. You can just print it out of, the, out of nothing. Press a few digits and it gets created. And then what you have is fraudulent tokenized energy circulating in the economy. And then what that does, it devalues my labor, that my fabulously crafted shoes will no longer earn me the equivalent of a gold ounce. Because there's so many euros that you've printed or the bankers have printed or the central bank has printed that are now circulating, chasing the same price of goods. It's not tokenized energy anymore. It's fraud. It's fake. It's been made up. So then yep. you get fakery and corruption and people covering up for themselves. And you get conflict, just like you get in a conflict in a society where people are lying to each other. The foundation of our relations within this complex society that we live in, post industrial society, is our communication in the form of tokenized energy or the fake derivatives of tokenized energy. I, I, I think that the whole thing is, it does seem like a bubble. What it doesn't affect people is, you know, as long as they can avoid it, I mean, tax, inflation is tax on, on savings, really. Yeah, well, it's it, tax it, on it, my it, labor. It, it, it diminishes the value of my energy. But I suppose if, if, if your labor is commanding more and more euros all the time but in terms of inflation, you probably don't notice. Okay, you say your labor is no longer, it will get you a gold ounce, but it will get you a higher number of euros, the more euros are there. Uh, so you, you can keep going, you don't really notice the fact that your labor is devalued. People will still they'll pay a lot more euros for a good pair of shoes, you know, I mean, that, 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 so you're still earning what appears to be something of value. It's a question of when the, when the bubble bursts. It's a question of, you know, that that's really what, well, there's two, two, two ways it hits on. One is the attack against the savings. And savings are very important. People do need yeah. savings for the rainy day and for putting house mortgages, house deposits and lots of support. And saving money now is, is, is just losing money. That's the real problem where I think, I think people see it. It's, it's a massive taxation on people's efforts to save and to accumulate money. And they see that, and that's that's happening, and that's clear. <laughs> but the question then is whether all assets will become worthless uh, by by virtue of a crash of, of the particular currency, and when that happens. And you know, you're saying it's happening already, um, but people don't really notice it. Other than the fact that their savings are hit, they don't really notice it. The asset that they have is now worth. They see it's worth well, it's worth more euros than it was three years ago. So I'm doing very well. And they managed to convince themselves, uh, but you know, yes, it, it, their asset may be worth more than it was three years ago. But everything else is far more expensive than it was three years ago. But it's it's when the whole the whole house of cards falls, that's when people really hurt, and that's that's when the whole society falls apart. And how? What's the mechanism for that happening? Um, is it war? Uh, is it um, is it just at the bubble burst? Is it at the end of the petrol dollar? Is that is that what's going to trigger this? This awful collapse that we all fear, uh, and of course, when you when you talk about a collapse of the euro, people say you're a doomsayer, and um, you know you need to. You've been saying this for too long. Not that I have, I don't think, but people don't want to believe the doom laden message, you know. And um, uh, they, they say look, the euro is still a sound currency. Now, clearly, isn't it? Anybody can see that it's not. And I, I think inflation is is the is the warning sign. It's the canary in the coal mine. Um, you know, when you have high inflation, it means you, that's a 
serious warning sign that your currency is is is, is worthless. And, and just looking at the, the the interest rates of the U.S. bonds, there, uh, and, you know, we, we we spoke about that. Um, and we seem to have been in an inflationary cycle from say when when the U.S. came off the gold standard up to the yes. year in the 80s when we had you know very serious interest rates that were 16, 17 percent, and a lot of people were. And the same thing happened, I think, again in the early 90s. I think we had very very high interest rates around until 92 or thereabouts. Uh, which nearly, which put a lot of businesses out of out of commission, but since then interest rates have been falling, and it seems to be that, that that was used as an effort to stimulate economies, I guess. But we always got to a situation where interest rates were zero, which is uh, which is well, not a good sign. Right? That, that, no, that's that. In Europe, you had negative interest rates. Yes, yes, that extraordinary situation. So you you can't you can't keep producing interest rates indefinitely, obviously. So I mean, is, is the next cycle another inflationary cycle? Is and is, and is that what we're in now? Is that what we've been in since about twenty twenty? I mean, the real serious inflation began to kick off around the same time as COVID came in. Yep. Coincidence? Coincidence or not coincidence? Who knows? <laughs> We, we, who, are, who, are, who are deeply suspicious of the COVID narrative might, might see a relationship there. I don't know. Uh, but certainly we're in a serious inflationary cycle now. Um, what's, what's the end game? Really, that's, that's what I'm trying to get a handle on. When does this all, when does the, 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 the substance hit the fan? You know, that's, that's the question. Um, well, Michael, there's, I can't, I, there's two end games. Yeah. Right. There's their end game, yeah. which is they uh, stoke up a war. To cover in Europe to cover up for the sovereign debt crisis, Europe is broke. Europe has no way of generating income, none. It did through German manufacturing, and German manufacturing could do so as long as it had cheap Russian energy, which it it sanctioned itself out of. So German businesses, industry has collapsed, and Germany was the powerhouse for the European Union. Doesn't Europe doesn't have cheap energy? So how can it tokenize energy and create wealth? Yeah, I worked for four years in Qatar, and or Qatar in English, I don't mm-hmm. know how to say it in Irish, right? But um, in they 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 they're digging money out of the ground in the form of gas. Yep. digging it out of the ground, sucking it out. In the, in, the, in the meantime, Ireland, which has gas reserves, has made it illegal to prospect for them. We have a green minister, and, and like it's uh, let's destroy our wealth. You know, we've got wealth on the ground. Let's pretend that this changes the climate, which is nonsense, of course. Uh, and let's make sure we're we're not going to be able to access our wealth. You know, go figure, go figure with the yeah. natural capacity of these guys. You know, and so that's that's, that's that, those are, I mean, and like the greenery is just it's popular at the moment. All the press likes and all the journalists like us. All the government is going to chase this. Well, this well, sanity. Well, well, no, all the same people who said that the injections were safe and effective, they're the ones who go along with this climate change agenda. The, the same mainstream media, same mainstream media that told us in the UK that in April 2022 that Russia was going to lose and was losing and they were running out of weaponry, right? So we can, we know where to put yeah, they're, 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 They were cannibalizing their fridges to get to, to yeah, get their washing machines, right? Yes. yes. Well, some, I mean, that, that just seems some nonsense. I tell you, I haven't been to Russia. You know, I, I, I saw the high tech industry in Russia as long ago as 30 years ago, and it was quite impressive, you know. And many more have their come since then, you know. Um, yeah, they, they, they get, it's, 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 there's a kind of a racist undercurrent there, you know. And if it's not the West, if it's not US or Europe, then it's second best. And, you know, I think they, they, they're, they're beginning to. They're beginning to learn a very hard lesson about that, you know. But it is that colonial mentality, you know. It's, yep. it's still very much there in, in European countries. Ireland doesn't have that, uh, but by being part of the European Union, we're becoming infected with the same the same mindset. I think, or, or rather, being colonized again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. But to go back to your question, so there's this: they, they got to stoke up a war to cover mm-hmm. up for the sovereign debt crisis because the debts are unpayable. There's no money in the pension pot. There's no money to pay out. And with the Europe, with the U.S. raising interest rates, you're having increasing drain of capital from the low interest rate zone in Euro to higher interest rates. I mean, if you had a billion dollars, where are you going to park it? Where you're going to get two and a half percent interest or four and a half percent interest? You're going to you have to park it where you're going to get higher interest because those are the conditions, you know, that you of your fund. So money's leaving, and. But with the war, well, okay, we have to do a reset. We have to default on the debt, and we're going to do so, and we're going to give you a CBDC. So that's their reset, right? And then our reset is, well, the CBDCs don't work out, or it never comes into place. People lose more and more confidence in using the euro and the pound, 
and the dollar, and they're transacting more and more with gold, silver, and uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Because that takes away the monopoly power that governments mm. and banks have to control our communication in the form of tokenized energy. Mm. Mm. So I, I okay. favor the second one, as I think you do as well, Michael. <laughs> I beg your pardon? I favor the second one, as you do as well, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And you said yeah. before we started recording about um, currencies being backed by perhaps a basket of commodities. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it, you know, I, Ireland doesn't have gold. It has, it may have some Aussie gas, you know, not huge reserves. But in terms of us, you know, one of the, the, the criteria that we will need if we are to reestablish Ireland as a, as a nation state, as an independent nation state, first of all, we've got to get out of the euro. That's, that's it's the sine qua non. You cannot have independence in this field of currency. And, you know, it's not as, as difficult to, uh, to set that up as you might think, but you do have something to back it. And, and we do have agricultural produce, we the price of beef, the, the price of wheat, you know, the, the, the price of dairy, all that the stuff that we do produce, you know, and uh, internationally traded services and skills and so on and so forth. Well, what is the price of those? Is, is that what we can base a currency on? Is that realistic? Uh, can you say, look, the Irish punt? will be pegged to the price of, the, of certain commodities and the price of certain skills. And is, is that realistic? Uh, or is, it, um, is, it is that a bit be. It could be, but I think ultimately it would need to be based upon gold. It would mm. need to be. One, if you back it with anything, it's a derivative, mm -hmm. it's not the thing itself. Yeah. And the temptation with any derivative, I mean, if, 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 I, had the, if I had the button that I could create more derivatives, more mm. Irish punts, to benefit me and my friends and my family, I would do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. so tempting. And that's what mm -hmm. happens because of human nature. So then mm -hmm. um, there's the risk of the supply of the derivatives being inflated, as mm -hmm. Nixon was doing with dollars before he took the dollar off the gold standard. Yeah. Then uh, the other thing is that the basket in the background has to be of such a nature that there's some sort of inbuilt scarcity. Mm -hmm. If it's based, there was a certain state, I can't remember, where they, they used tobacco as, as money. Now the Probably Virginia or something. Possibly, the, but the, I can't remember which state it was, right? But the thing about tobacco is it degrades. Mm. It's not durable. Yep. And then yep. also, uh, people can grow more tobacco. Mm. You can start growing tobacco secretly in your own back garden. But mm -hmm. if you start doing that, that'll devalue the nature of, the value of yep. my tobacco. So then I'm going to attack yep. your garden. Right, to preserve the value of my tobacco, so uh, so it's got it can't be something that can increase too much. Yeah, to have scarcity built in, and gold has that, and silver has that, and Bitcoin even more so because Bitcoin is of fixed supply, unlike gold and silver oil. So, uh, and and I think Tom made the point, if not with the three of us when we were all three together, or another, what we actually have is an oil-backed currency system. Yeah, oil is the obvious one. Um, you know, it's, it's it's limited, and unfortunately, we, we ain't got it. We got a bit of gas, which our minister wants to keep under the ocean and make sure we never have access to it. He really smart guys, these ones, you know, on the basis of this this made up science, this magic science of global warming, the greatest fraud. I I, I don't know if you agree with me. I believe that. Oh, completely. There have, been many serious, there have been many serious frauds in their days, but that must be the greatest. I, I remember that. Remember the the the, the Y two K that. Utter tomfoolery that happened in the 90s. People were talking about it. as soon as the first of, of, of January 2000 came along, the whole world would collapse. And fortunes were made. Fortunes were spent by public. I remember TDs in banging their fists on the table. What are you doing about the white two? And I just knew this is rubbish, you know. Yeah. And I, in my office, I had to put in these white 2K compliance certificates. And I just would say, well, we have a Macintosh system, and that doesn't kick in until 2037. Complete nonsense, but which was actually the case. They, they felt they would have the same thing. 2037 rather than year 2000. And the guys who were dealing with this, they just accepted this every time, never looked into it. They didn't know what the hell they were dealing with. But they just said, you know, huge sums of money were wasted on this. And consultancies may become billionaires over this nonsense. And of course, nothing happened then. And they all forgot about it. Nobody, everybody stopped talking about it. It just, it was one of the worst illustrations of the dishonesty of modern politics, modern media driven politics I've ever seen. And then, of course, the climate, you know, the climate scare was happening before then. But, you know, it's the same. It's just nonsense. There's no base. No, when you look at the science, when you actually go into it, you know, there's a lot of reasons why climate is changing. And our input into it is very, very tiny. And there is no crisis, by the way. 
There's no crisis. But they're, they're using this to justify mass migration. Oh, the poor people have to come from Africa because they're, they're, they're in a different slot. This is garbage at the worst level. They're, they, they're, they're using it. For welfare. Sorry? Michael, they're using it to justify mm-hmm. colonialism and control. The, the yeah. thing about carbon dioxide is that, you know, if, if, if you know, they get what they want to get in is a system with a biometric ID. So that's connected yeah. to you only, uh, a digital wallet in which they can deposit their central bank digital currency and have it linked to a carbon tracker. Carbon dioxide is a great proxy for human activity. I can measure how far you've traveled. I can um, oh, you're traveling, awful. what yeah. you're eating, everything, because we're carbon-based yeah. life forms. So, and, and the other thing about it, I absolutely agree with you. And I didn't always, I have, forgive me, Michael, I have voted green. We do have yeah. solar panels. I drive a very old Prius. I we're, all, we're, all, we're all young and foolish one time, Rich. That's yeah. right. I cycle around, but then I, I do like cycling. My yeah, bike, but it keeps, you fit. Yeah. keeps me fit. A 20-year-old yeah, yeah. custom-built bicycle. I'm very yeah, happy yeah, with yeah. it still, right? Um, but when I started looking into it, and mm. one of the things that struck me about it is that it's a top-down agenda. It's corporates. It's government agencies and governments. And I thought, in all my years of being involved in political struggle, like the anti-apartheid movement wasn't top down. The yeah. anti-war movement against the war in Iraq wasn't top down. The free Assange movement, it's not top down. I'm like, wait a minute, corporations and governments, they don't care about people. So that was the first thing that I was like, oh, this is a bit fishy. Let me dig into, mm. let me dig into this. Yeah. And then isn't it funny, Michael, the continent that is a net importer of hydrocarbons which has a tradition, a legacy, a recent legacy of telling the rest of the world what's good for them and how they need to live is now telling the world that they have to do it without hydrocarbons. European imperialism redux for the 21st century. It used to be Christianity yeah. as a cover for slavery, genocide and plundering resources. And now it's the climate change agenda. So yeah. Tanzania, Bangladesh, Burundi, no hydrocarbons for you. Mm-hmm. And it ain't gonna fly because yeah. it, yeah, yeah, yeah. it it's yeah. a fraud. Mm-hmm. It's a fraud. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I should interpose that Christianity brought certain, not not just certain huge benefits as well to many places. So I, 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 I don't, but you know, I, I take no, it. No, no, Mike, Michael, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not knocking Christianity at all. Not at all. Yeah. It's the you the, the imperialists weren't yeah, it, interested it, it, in yeah, Christianity. Yeah, yeah. I, I I know it was used it, it, it was used as an excuse to do other things. You know, yeah, that's, that's that was the cover. Oh, we're bringing Christianity yeah. to the heathens. Meanwhile, yeah. They're, yeah, yeah. they're breaking up families. That's not a Christian thing to do. Of course, yeah. Yep. All right, uh, Rich. Well, that's been, been want, very anything interesting. You want to, anything you want to say to finish up? Uh, look, you know, I, I I think people are becoming very alarmed and they don't know what the reason is. They, 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 there's an edginess out there. I see it in so many people as I go around canvassing and they're not really relating it to money. They, they see the European Union as stable. I, I feel it's not stable. I feel, and I think wars bring these things to a head. Yeah. And uh, that's why I, I, I think this war may lead to this crisis that may lead to the breakup of the European Union. Um, I, I don't want to see a precipitate breakup of the European Union. I, I would like to see it being dissolved. Uh, there are certain difficulties with it. The currency is certainly one of them. Uh, the top-down political system that we have is certainly one of them. And that's corrupted democracies throughout the European Union, including our own. Um, it's corrupted our judicial system, as far as I'm concerned, uh, and our environmental protection system. I think these are being used now for very nefarious purposes. Uh, and, and that's got to change. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I do relate a lot of our problems to the, the very dysfunctional way in which the European Union works, both at a currency level and at a political level. And that's what I want to see changing. But I don't want to see the whole thing collapse. Collapses just cause chaos and, you know, it can take generations to recover from them. So I certainly do not look forward to a currency collapse. I think, you know, if, if enough people can realize, look, this system is simply not working, we've got to put something in this place that does actually work. And part of that is the basis of that is stable currency or currencies. And I don't see any reason. Like, I think one of the main problems is having so many different economies with a single currency. That's not a good idea. You know, and you can say it worked in the United States. It worked for some states in the United States. It didn't, many of the states didn't benefit from having a single currency throughout the, throughout the whole continent. <laughs> and certainly, I don't think Ireland has benefited from having a single currency. The only benefit, I mean, the, the, what people like about it is you can travel to France without having to pay your money. Okay, that's that's a benefit, but it's pretty damn, it's pretty small potatoes compared to the, the downsides. It's pretty small potatoes compared to the fact that we have to take on the 68, $64 billion debt to bail out Germany's banks and France's banks over lending it to Ireland. 
you know, it's, 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 a, it's not, not much of a trade-off, is it? You know? um, so, look, you know, I, I, I'm campaigning in this European Parliament election uh, on the Eurosceptic platform, and I think that is becoming a respectable position in Europe. I think there are so many parties now throughout emerging throughout Europe, and it's going to be a very, very different Parliament in the new European Parliament. I hope Ireland can be part of that. I hope we can play a role in that. And I think, uh, you know, Irish people can play a role at an international level because we tend to be trusted having been a neutral country, not having been a colonial power in the past. Uh, and I would love to see us playing a role in that. I, I would love to see us playing a role in the dissolving of the European Union and putting together some kind of a sensible structure in uh, our own trade and around the harmonizing, you know, a certain amount of harmonization of trade. Now, the, the problem is that the harmonization of trade was used as a means of imposing over-regulation, uh, to, and that's not necessary. That's no. I mean, people, have, people have traded with each other for hundreds of years, but they're now saying, if you want to trade with Germany, you have to have uh, a DEI system, you have to have a certain proportion of, of uh, black people working in your own business. This is not necessary for trade, you know? Uh, and it's, it's 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 being used to promote a, a horrible, dysfunctional, politically correct agenda. Uh, and that's I could see that coming right from the start. You know, with, with all which, if you want to trade with people, you have to trade on an equal basis. But then th that was used as a cover for bringing all kinds of, of nonsense yeah. uh, into our legislative re regimes that simply don't work and are not necessary. So look, I'm continuing to campaign. I I, I need to cut. I have a lot of calls to answer now. So sure, I'm the sure. best Michael, very, just very quickly, what you've just said just demonstrates, I think, reinforces for me, and I hope people watching that the euro. And the European Union is a colonial project because mm -hmm. it's impoverished mm -hmm. Ireland and the, mm -hmm. the the other the poorer southern and eastern nations, and who's benefited are the northern European nations. Now, um, I just want to ask you, what's the reception you're getting on the doorstep? Look, it's very good, and mainly around the issue of immigration in Ireland, I have to say, that's by far the largest issue. And I think at last people are beginning to see, look, Europe has too much control over this country. Yeah. Uh, we've always been supporters of the European Union. We saw, look, being in the European Union got us out from under defeat of our large neighbour, Britain, which had dominated the country for a very long time. Um, but I now think uh, people are beginning to get fed up with it. Uh, every time the government can't do something, it's because, oh, well, that would be against European rules. And people are just getting very tired of it. Uh, and they are looking, they're, they're casting abroad for alternatives. We're an overtly Eurosceptic party, but, uh, you know, I, I say to people again, we're not looking for a precipitate withdrawal. For a small country like Ireland to, to, to suddenly pull out of the European Union, we, we, they, would, they would destroy us. They'd come after us, they'd destroy us. The fact that Britain has come out gives us some alternatives, but we're not in a position to do that. First of all, we have to set up a currency, and that has to be created internationally and accepted. Then maybe we can begin to withdraw. I think one of the things we should do is take back our fishery rights, which we, we gave away and we were forced to give away and join the European Union, which was a colossal loss of, of wealth and reserves for us. So I, I think a gradual detachment. And there are many, many other countries in Europe who want the same process. And I think you're going to see that emerging after these European Union elections. You're going to see a lot of countries, a lot, a lot of parties emerging. You may have your skeptic majority in the European Union Parliament after this. And if that happens, I think it will be a game changer because even though the Parliament doesn't have great power, it can cause significant difficulties for the European Commission. The European Commission is not elected, it's high-handed, it's authoritarian, you know, incompetent people like Ursula van der Leyen, who was kicked upstairs to the European Presidency of the European Commission because they couldn't, they couldn't stomach her in Germany, you know. Um, Angela Merkel was even at her, she was, her main skill was holding on to power herself and uh, but her land was a bit of trouble for her, so she got rid of her. And what did she do? She imposed them, she imposed her and the rest of us, you know, which, is, which is kind of the way Germany operated the European Union. Um, but look, those days are coming to an end. Um, uh, and I, I think we are going to see a change after these elections. I hope Ireland can be part of that change. The winds of change is sweeping through Europe, and let's, let's see if it brings a bit of sense and a bit of common sense into the whole structure. Okay. Fabulous. Thanks. Thank you so much. I'll have all the links you. to you and to the Irish Freedom Party in the description below. And, you know, please share this video. Get this out to people in Ireland through your friends and contacts. And where you are in Ireland, I would suggest, recommend, invite you to vote for a non-establishment party, the Irish Freedom Party, or one of the many, many independents that are standing for sovereignty and freedom from European colonial rule. And Ireland, said the Pakistani to the Irishman, Ireland belongs to the Irish. <laughs> Great talking okay. to you. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.